The Rebel Capitalist Show. It gives me a great deal of pleasure to bring someone to the Rebel Capitalist Show that I've really looked forward to talking to. I have a tremendous amount of respect for this young gentleman. I've been following his work probably since 2012, since I retired. His name is Andrew Henderson. He is the nomad capitalist. Andrew, welcome to the Rebel Capitalist Show. From the, the rebel to the nomad, it's, thanks for having me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Now, I don't know if there's a person out there that philosophically I'm more aligned with than, than you. And uh, whether it's the way we see the world or the way we see business or macro, uh, liberty, personal freedom. But for my viewers who don't know your backstory fully, can you get us up to speed there? Well, it's very kind of you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, when I was 12 years old, I got a very unique permission slip from my father. He said, listen, you don't have to stay in the same place where you were born. Uh, we lived in Cleveland, Ohio. If you're from the United States, you know what to say to someone from Cleveland, Ohio. I'm sorry to hear that. He said, listen, <laughs> uh, your parents or your friend's parents are telling their, you know, they're telling your friends, hey, you got to stay here because we're going to get old. Who's going to take care of us? He said, listen, you don't have to stay in the city, the state. You don't even have to stay in the country. And he said, as you become newly interested in business, which I was at 12 years old. He said, you ought to go where you're treated best because, uh, you know, that's, uh, you know, what's happening in the Western world back then, which has played out now 25 years later, is that uh, Western countries don't treat entrepreneurs, value creators the best. And I think he saw that before a lot of people saw that. And uh, it was the idea that uh, if one place is not treating you well, you might as well go to the place that does. And so what I've done that's changed in those last 25 years or so is I've said, not only is there one place that will treat you best, but you can slice and dice that up kind of like a buffet where there's one place where if you've got a bank, that's the best place to bank. There's the best place to have your company. There's the best place or places to live, place or places to, to date, uh, to raise your kids, you know, whatever the case may be, let's just separate it out and choose from the best that there is. Right. And th now you call this your trifecta strategy or is that something else? Cause I've been listening to you talk about that on your podcast. Well, so the five magic words as I've, as I've sometimes said is go where you're treated best, which right. I think is what our, our natural human nature is. Uh, what I've also talked about is what I call the trifecta strategy, which is people say, well, where is the best place to live? And as I've traveled over the last, uh, I guess this is my 13th year of, of really doing it with the intent of seeing what the opportunities are in the world. It's hard for me to choose one place. I like a couple of different places. And so what I've suggested is you can have what I call the trifecta where from a personal lifestyle, as well as a tax planning perspective, mm. split your time up four months here, four months there, four months here. You know, this year it's kind of harder. I'm in Malaysia. Can't think of a better place that I would want to be for freedom, for just enjoying life, not a lot of restrictions right now. But I can tell you on a given year, 12 months in Malaysia gets to me a little bit. I want to go to Mexico. I want to go to Europe. But I always want to come back. And so I think you can have multiple bests. Yeah. Why do you think it's such a psychological hurdle for Americans as a whole to venture out and to explore, like getting a second passport? And I, I think I, I know why, but I'd love to hear your insight because this is your business. I mean, this is, this is what you yeah. do, well, especially for Americans. Why, why is that so difficult? Well, I posted today uh, on some social media. I said, you know, the countdown has now begun until uh, one side of the country or the other in the United States gets to renege on their promise to move to Canada when their guy loses. Uh, and <laughs> yeah, it's always that like that, right? Oh, yeah. Um, I look at every country as a brand, right? I mean, you look at colas, for example. You've got Coca-Cola, you've got RC Cola, you've got what my mother would buy growing up, like the Sam's Club Cola. Every <laughs> cola, you know, they're all brands, right? The United States is Coca-Cola, and it's been around, and people just drink it because that's all they know. They don't, they've never tried the Sam's Club Cola. Maybe that Sam's Club Cola is better, who knows? But they try Coca-Cola. And I think so many people around the world are convinced that it's the best country on earth. If you look at any you know, qualitative study, quantitative study, it's not the best they have. Back when you want a bank to be solid, back in the last Great Recession, 2008, 2009, the banks were the 40th safest. If you stacked up all the countries, 
U.S. was number 40, 39 countries. How many Americans could name 39 other countries, let right. alone 39 with better banks than in theirs? And so there's no metric by which really any country is number one in everything, certainly let alone anything. Or, uh, but, you know, I think people uh, have bought into this brand, which is what has made the U.S. so successful. They've done a great job of branding their country. And I think like many once great brands, there was a time when it was worth it. You know, there was a time when you bought a pair of Gucci loafers and you paid a lot, but they really were hand sewn by Giuseppe in Italy. Now, the rumor is, you know, they're in the European Union. They ship them off to Romania. They send them back. Some guy stamps made in Italy and someplace in Milan and off they go. They save a bunch of money. It's not the same quality it once was. And to me, I look at countries like the United States much the same way. Yeah. And plus Gucci was never the same once Tom Ford left. Let's be honest. Well, Tom Ford was, you're correct. Tom Ford's a great uh, <laughs> hero of mine, you know. Right. From one Gucci guy to another. It was all about Tom <laughs> Ford. That's for sure. Okay, uh, in a recent podcast, I heard you talk about this concept of a global tax. Mm. And you were talking about how the United States, actually, you know what, before we get there, I wanna mention one thing, because I, I wanna address this before, we, uh, before I forget. And one of the big uh, drawbacks I hear people say in the United States, as far as going to another country where they might be treated best, or they might have a lower uh, tax rate, a, lower, um, uh, a better standard of living, is that it's not safe. It's mm. not safe. Oh, how, oh I, am I safe? Is it safe there? Is it safe there? And the, the bizarre irony to me is if you look at any of the countries I've traveled to, the, probably the least safe country, especially right now, with the riots and the looting and everything else, is actually the United States. Uh, uh, when you drill down into these urban areas, uh, more specifically. But I mean, you've been to pretty much every country in the world with your <laughs> travels. Uh, how does the U.S. rank or Canada or Australia in, uh, how do you rank it as far as the safety levels compared to a country that might, others might deem as, well, is it safe there? You know, you're in Malaysia right now, and I'm sure you get that from a lot of your uh, family members that aren't familiar specifically what you do. Well, Andrew, is it safe there? And I know I always get that in Colombia. I spend a lot of time in Medellin. I've been investing in real estate there since 2015. We'll get into that in a moment, but that's what I always hear, of course. Oh my gosh, George, uh, you know, but Pablo Escobar, you're gonna get kidnapped. And you know, as soon as they come down and visit me, they're like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I was saying that. But uh, how, how do you see that? Well, I think first of all, you have to have a fair comparison. You know, people, I have a friend, for example, who lives in Chicago, but he'll tell you, I don't live in Chicago. I live in this far, you know, out suburb where everything's pretty safe here. now. When these protests were happening, I see I try not to pay too much attention to the news in the U.S. to every detail, but I seem to have recalled that they were talking about they were going to come to the suburbs, and in fact, in his suburb, in the downtown area, not where he lives, but in the downtown, every store's window was smashed out in this you know lily white suburb where you know they never had anything bad happen to them, and. Uh, so I, I do think it's becoming worse in the United States, and I think it's only going to become worse as time goes on. But I think you have to have a fair comparison. You know, for him to say, don't go to, you know, I own a home in Bogota, for example. We're in different parts of the country in Colombia. You know, if you went to the, the far south of Bogota, yeah, you're probably going to get killed. But no, but you're not going to go there. Let's compare apples to oranges. Let's compare the far out suburb of Chicago to the far out suburb of, of Bogota. You know, where I live is surrounded by ambassadors and embassies. Okay, they got that place on lock. So I think you can find a safe place anywhere. Now, if you look at the safest countries in the world, um, Georgia, one I've been at, an advocate mm -hmm. of a long time, one of the safest countries. Yeah. Every person I know there has a story of, I left my $5,000 camera in the backseat of a taxi and the guy hunted me down for 48 hours to bring it back. Or when I left $1,000 on a table in a restaurant and they brought it back to my lawyer's office intact. Or, you know, whatever, you know, my, my wife, you know, or other, you know, women I know will walk around at three in the morning uh, after going out to a, a party or to a club. Um, and so if you look at the, the, the facts, I mean, I think Belarus, UAE, Singapore, South Korea, Georgia, some of the safest. Mm. Uh, but I also think, by and large, I pretty, I felt safe pretty much everywhere. I've, I've been in Nom Penh, Cambodia, walking around at one in the morning. I felt perfectly fine. The one place that's probably a bit of an issue is Central America, 
I did have a gun put in my face in Managua, Nicaragua, not a place anyone should be going or could be going. I was just trying to meet lawyers and people with some, some prestige. Otherwise, you wouldn't go to this dreadful capital city. Right. Um, so Central America is maybe the one part of the world where in the capital cities, Cusacalpa, Honduras, San Pedro Sula, Honduras, uh, San Salvador didn't feel particularly safe in El Salvador. I might avoid that part of the world. But even Mexico, plenty of safe places. Merida, nice neighborhoods in Mexico City. To spend two months there, you'll be fine. Yeah. I, yeah, I think that's a, a great point. I want to make sure that I'm clear with the Americas. I, I'm not here just to kind of bash the U.S. or anything. I'm just trying to make sure that people are seeing the entire world from a standpoint of how it really is and, and not how you perceive it to be in your mind. And my main thrust with this podcast or, or what I've been saying on my YouTube channel is there's just, especially right now, if you're an American, get your passport first and foremost. And if you've got a passport, think about getting a second one because there's just no downside to it. So, get your first passport because, I mean, look, yeah. I did a uh, real transaction recently with a guy uh, where he was in the U.S., I'm here, the property's in a third place, everything's fine with power of attorney, we have a great team there. He couldn't renew his U.S. passport. He's like, well, I'm not traveling, I'll leave it for later. And that, that is kind of an American thing. I mean, you know, we hire people all around the world and the, the intake process is send us a copy of your passport. No one's ever told me, oh, I figured I wasn't going anywhere, so I don't have one. I mean, you never know when they could shut down uh, the passport office and just decide, you know what, coronavirus, six months, run a business, stay where you are. Yeah, exactly. I've got an anecdotal story about that, too, but I don't want to get too sidetracked here. So let's move on to that podcast that you just did about a potential global tax. And I want to, uh, I want to really point out maybe a fact that most people don't know, maybe they do, and that's that the U.S. is pretty much the only country in the entire world that taxes its citizens on their worldwide income, regardless of where their tax residency is at, this, at the time. So can you outline how that works and then go through yeah. that recent podcast that you did on this potential global tax? Well, you're seeing more countries do that. I've been predicting that for a while. So now you see, you know, the Chinese are taxing Chinese who live in Hong Kong. Colombia, much as I love Colombia, they said, hey, if you're Colombian and you live in Panama, that's a tax haven on our list. So we're going to double tax you. Same that uh, France doesn't have any French who live in Monaco. It's zero tax for everybody except for the French. Uh, and so you've seen, you know, exceptions like that over the, over the course of history. Now you're seeing China, South Africa move more toward it. You're seeing Canada and other countries talk about it. Uh, but what happens in the United States is you are required as a U.S. citizen, your tax home is basically, at least one of them is in the United States. So if you start a company somewhere else, um, if you have a job somewhere else, all that income that gets dumped on your head is reportable to the IRS on your Form 1040. You've also got to file forms like 5471 for your foreign corporation. There may be other forms depending on what your, your whole corporate structure looks like. You've also got to report your bank accounts overseas. They uh, meet or exceed $10,000, any foreign financial accounts. So if you have $10,000 in a bank account, even for one day, and you don't report it, it's up to 50% of the penalty of the account. Now, what does that mean? It does not mean that you cannot live overseas and reduce your taxes. Americans can move to Puerto Rico and pay into the single digits. They can also go overseas, and depending on what they make, they may be able to, to pay zero if they work for a foreign corporation, which includes a foreign corporation that you started for yourself in your own business. Uh, if you start to make you know, well into the six figures, you are going to pay something, uh, but you can still drastically uh, reduce that amount. But And they have the foreign earned the income exclusion, don't they, up to 110 or 115, something like that? Yeah, it's about $107,600 in earned income exclusion this year. You might be able to use the standard deduction as well in some cases, so potentially up to about $10,000 a month. It could be totally tax-free if you structure your company properly, but then you've got to have a foreign company. You can't just you know, be a freelancer. To have a company, there's certain criteria you need to have. It can't just be just to have a company. There's certain things that, that it needs to do to, to meet the definition of a business under the IRS rules. And then, of course, you're also subject. I've got friends who do business in emerging markets. They're not allowed to bribe people, even if that's the tradition. Now, most of us aren't going to deal with bribing people, but they're still subject to that. You, you can't deal with certain nationalities or certain people on the OFAC list. There's all kinds of restrictions. Mm. So, you know, plus, you know, there's certain things that if, if it's a crime in the U.S., even if it's not a crime where you do it, they could bring you back and prosecute you there. 
So there's a whole lot of restrictions. Obviously, you know, a lot of us aren't looking to do business with Iranians or, uh, you know, bribe public officials. But you've got to file, you've got to pay, you've got to report. They're going to know what's going on. And so you can reduce your taxes. But, you know, if you're not lucky enough to be able to live in a low tax country that just leaves you alone and you go and live in a place like London or something, now you've got two fighting tax systems. And that's when it really gets beyond the tax bureaucratic. Right, right. But but so I, I want to just unpack this a little more so people understand. Sure. Usually when you're a citizen of a country and you live, let, let's say you're a citizen of Australia and right. then you go to Hong Kong, you're living in Hong Kong, you've lived in Hong Kong for, or let's use Singapore, maybe is a better example now. Uh, you've lived in Singapore for 20 years. You have all your income coming in in Singapore. You're a tax resident of Singapore. Therefore, you pay taxes to the Singaporean government, let's say it's a 20% rate. And regardless of what the rate is back in Australia, although you're still an Australian citizen, you still have your Australia passport, it doesn't even matter to you because you're not paying taxes. You're not a tax resident of, uh, of Australia. Now, where that differs with the United States is this exact same scenario. If you're still a, a US citizen, they are taxing your worldwide income regardless of where you're a tax resident. So if you're the same person in Singapore, you've been working there for 20 years, all your income coming in at a 20% tax rate, you take the delta between what you're paying in Singapore and what you would have paid in the United States, let's say it's 40%, and you owe that additional 20% to the United States, although you haven't even been there in 20 years. That's the big difference. Am I correct? There's, there's exclusions and how is the company set up? And now there's like subpart F and there's all kinds of, I mean, it gets so complicated. But yeah, I mean, especially without proper planning and, and with some of the changes that they made about three years ago. Yeah, I mean, theoretically, uh, someone who's new to this stuff, which, you know, I do this for a living. We've got a whole network of tax people and, and uh, we try and coordinate this stuff globally. You know, we'll work with six or seven or eight different people in one person's case in each country that they're involved in. Uh, but, uh, you know, part of the issue is just, is indeed the bureaucracy and that most people aren't able to keep up with it. They come to us and I see them making the simplest of mistakes. I had a guy for 15 years, he was living overseas, not at a tax haven. I mean, in Singapore, you can go, by the way, if you have investments outside of Singapore, they don't tax it. So now you can make investments in places where they don't tax your dividends, don't tax your capital gains. Singapore doesn't tax it. And so now it's a situation of, you know, what's your salary? You know, you can run companies outside of Singapore. So you're able to drastically reduce it in most cases, even below that 20% and exclude many types of income altogether because you chose the best place for you. Um, but, you know, I had a guy who lived in, uh, in Europe, hardly a tax haven. The guy was paying a boatload of tax. And uh, nobody ever told him he had to report his bank accounts. We had to step in and go and beg for mercy mm. um, because he had an accountant who didn't realize this most simple of facts. And so I figured to myself, if people can't figure that out, they're probably going overseas and dramatically overpaying or they're leaving their self themselves open to just, you know, terrible violations of liabilities. The law. Yeah, you that's know? right. And, and, but, but you're under the, um, you, you kind of have the hypothesis that the way the U.S. does things is going to be kind of the standard operating procedure for countries in the West moving forward. So countries like Australia, countries like the U.K. I think you mentioned Sweden in your podcast where you're like, you know, it, it's your civil duty wherever you are in the oh, world right. to go ahead and pay the Swedish government tax. And, you know, the, the Swedish people, they're, they might, uh, I don't know if I want to say the word favor, but they might be more receptive to that <laughs> than, well, yeah. than other uh, cultures, but you kind of see that potentially coming down the pipeline. So it, it's something that I, I think everyone, especially Americans, should be cognizant of right now and thinking through, listen, the, and I think you had a fantastic point in your podcast where the, the debts are going up and up and up. Oh, with, yeah. With these sovereign uh, countries, but the opportunity and people's willingness to travel is also increasing due to the internet, Instagram, uh, you know, travel vlogs, stuff like that. So more and more people are thinking about moving to other countries where they're potentially, uh, you know, treated best, while at the same yeah. time, governments 
need your money more now and they will in the future more than ever so it's the this this clash of these two things coming together i agree and and it's funny the i think like the first time i was in china back in uh, 2008 uh something like that i remember they had a little bit different system than the u.s i loved finding all these differences around the world where your area code basically was it was like one area code or a series of area codes if you had a mobile phone and I was working on online and I was basically, I had a services business. I used a phone, I used email. That's how I ran this virtual business in the uh, broadcasting industry. And I thought, oh my God, I'd be cooked because I was like 23 years old. And <laughs> one of my, actually the friend who lives in Chicago, he was a, a big, one of my biggest clients back then. And he'll still tell you this thing. When Andrew called me, I thought he was 87 years old. And so... <laughs> Imagine like there's this guy, you don't know how old he is. He's calling you on a cell phone back in 2008. You probably don't take him seriously. Now nobody cares. They don't care if you're in China. They don't uh -huh. care if you're in the United States. They don't care if you're calling from a landline, a cell right. phone, a Skype phone. I mean, from Telegram, whatever. And so I do think that you're going to see more people being open to that. But yes, I think uh, more people are going to, um, or more countries are going to say, listen, there's no political disadvantage to us to come after these greedy traders who live in Dubai. I don't know if every country is going to copy the U.S. model in general uh, or entirely, mm -hmm. but I think that they might say, kind of like what the U.S. did with the provision called guilty. Listen, if you don't pay X percentage somewhere else, you pay it here. Right. So our minimum threshold as Swedes or as the European Union or as Australians, everyone should pay 15%, for example. That's the right thing to do, right? For the children and all the other cliches they throw in there. And so if you're not paying, you send us your proof of 15%. If you move from Australia to Sweden and they're raking you over the coals, God bless you. You pay Sweden, we're happy. But if you're living in Dubai, if you're living in Vanuatu, if you're living in Panama or Malaysia, you send us the 15% you're saving because how dare you? And you know, I have close to 10 million eyeballs a year, including a lot of people who comment. And I'm seeing a lot more comments from, well, if you have our passport, why shouldn't you be paying us a tie? Mm. And I thought that was a privilege of where you were born. You're part of the club. We're, we're all together. Kumbaya. Uh-uh. Now it's about what are you contributing to us? Yeah, right. Exactly. All right. So I, I want to try to break this down for kind of individual groups. And yeah. if you would, if someone's watching this, and they're saying, okay, what Andrew is saying really makes sense. I, I get it. I, I want to start offshoring my life. Even though I might not want to move out of the United States, I just want to have that as an option. What's my downside to setting up a plan B? So what sh what's the first thing they should do? Should they go to a country? This is what I suggest. And let me get your feedback on this. Well, I, I always tell people, listen, just you know, do some due diligence. Look at a country that you think you might like spending time, such as let's say Colombia, three and a half hour flight from Miami, no problem. But go there for a couple weeks on your next vacation. Right. See if you like it. And if you do like it, which I assume you will, then set up a bank account there. Just go through the process, get it done, and then come back to the United States and then discuss it more. And then maybe if it's something that you want to take the next step, consider buying some real estate there, maybe a small apartment, and then apply for your, uh, your, your, your visa, your investor visa, and then kind of go through. And every step takes you closer to getting that second passport. And if you get it, then all of a sudden you got your dual citizenship, you got your plan B. So if it hits the fan in the US, you, you wanna just get out and watch things from a distance and you go down to Columbia, you already know you enjoy spending time there. That, that's kind of taking baby steps, but uh, you're the pro, how do you suggest people do that? And then I wanna kind of outline how different people can do it at different income brackets. Say you're making sure. 250 plus, you're making 100 or you're making 50. Well, let me, let me start with just the general idea. I, I agree with going, and I think one of the great first steps people can do is they can open a bank account. Now as someone who owns a property in Colombia and I've been through the process in Colombia, it's often hard to get cash out of the ATM. I mean, I think if you bring a dime into that country, they've got a dog on you. Uh, so that's not the place you're going to go and get a bank account. Um, they're very strict there. But uh, could you go to Ecuador, for example, and get a bank account? Yeah, you can. In fact, they pay a lot higher interest. And you know, the official currency of, of Ecuador is the US dollar. So not a great diversification tool, but at least it's an easy step if you're an American to step into. 
Uh, and so I do think that that first step is interesting because here's what you're going to do. If you go to an Ecuador, an Armenia, a Georgia, something like that, where you can open a bank account, it's pretty much any nationality. They don't really need to deal with the residents as many countries now do. Let's say you put a hundred dollars, 500, a thousand dollars in there. You're going to go home and you're going to go and you're going to look six months later and miraculously your money is still there. Maybe you take some out of the ATM <laughs> and you realize it's all pretty much the same. Right. Now, okay. You know, don't go and put your money in a Syrian bank and expect the best experience, but by, you know, we're using reasonable precautions here. And, you know, I've, I've had over a thousand people, uh, probably more even now, write to us and say, hey, I went to Georgia and opened a bank account. And I go, and I talk to the government, I say, listen, do you know how many of these people, they started there and then they went out and then they, they it was, they're thinking about it. And then they came yeah. back because they love the wine. They love the food. They love how affordable it was. One comment people tell me about uh, Yerevan and Tbilisi in those countries is, it's a lot better than I thought. And so they come back and maybe the next time they buy an apartment, okay, people say, oh yeah, I bought an apartment for $200,000. Now, where I think I would change the strategy is I would look at diversifying it. So Colombia, for example, might not be a bad place to live and I might buy an apartment there. If I'm gonna live in Colombia more than six months a year, it's tax city. So I'm gonna make sure I have somewhere else to go for the rest of the year if I don't wanna be sucked into their net. It takes a number of years to get their passport. Um, it may not be the good only passport to have. It's a good plan B though. What I would do is I would just probably be doing a couple of different things at once. I might go and set up a residence somewhere in a country where I didn't have to live there a lot of the year to later get a passport and then make Colombia where I live, you know, make um, somewhere else where I, I bank, make somewhere else where I've got the passport brewing. I might go out and try and get a passport through my ancestry. If I've got a parent, great grandparent or grandparent, great grandparent, but I can get immediately. I might make an investment if I'm wealthy enough. I did the St. Lucia passport program. You send them $100,000, they send you a passport a few months later. No must, no fuss. And uh, you think they're gonna impose a bunch of taxes on their citizens and stop the flow of people coming and uh, making investments in their country? Of course not. So I would try and, 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 and divvy it up a little bit, but I think you're right that the first step is proving to yourself that it can be done right. and that your money's not gonna be sucked into a black hole. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And just uh, putting your big toe in the water and just kind of getting yeah. acclimated to it. And I can almost promise you that once you start going through the process, once you spend a little time there, you're like, wait a minute, this isn't like moving to a different country. It's basically like moving to a different state. It's like going from uh, California to Texas or something like that. It's a lot less but scary. I always tell people, I always tell people, don't do that. Because once you're moving, what are, where are the kids going to go to school? Everything's going to be so. Once you're moving, you might as well just give it all it's got. You might as well just go over to Puerto Rico, Panama, you know, push the pedal to the metal. Once you're changing your life, just push it all the way it can go. Yeah, I, yeah, that's a, I just, I try to tell people that there's so many places in the world where the quality of life is just as good as the United States, if not a lot better oh my, when you look at the cost of living. And it's just about getting out there and experiencing it yourself. And, uh, you know, one thing with Columbia is, is I got set up with Alianza back in 2015 when mm -hmm. I first went there. And I, I've, I've had like kind of my person there. I, I know them on a first name basis. I'm down there all the time in Medellin. And once I got connected to them, setting up a bank account with Banco Columbia, uh, it, it was just super, super, super easy, mm -hmm. but you got to have that, that in and that person first. If you don't have that, then yeah, they're looking at you like, you know, who, who the heck that, is that it? is the thing about the world, right? And this is what I've spent 13 years doing is building that network. And mm -hmm. a lot of people don't know what they're doing, even in their own country. Sometimes I'll go and I know more than they do. And so that's not the person you want. Um, but you know, it's, it admittedly, there's no Zillow for buying real estate, for example. Some, <laughs> yeah, some, yeah. Way, someone should, I've been saying that for years, someone should start that. And, and someone actually did go to Serbia. I don't know if they're a fan of ours or not. And they started the most beautiful website, City Expert, for buying property. I mean, it looks like a US quality website. Yeah. It's very rare in many of these countries, but that opaqueness you know, comes with a lot of benefits, better lifestyle, lower costs, lower taxes. Yeah, and going back to your real estate point, it creates a massively inefficient market, which if you know what you're doing, right. you can really leverage that. You can make a lot of money because of those inefficiencies. If you don't know what you're doing, you're going to get your butt handed to you because you're just the gringo coming down there playing gringo prices 
and just uh, sometimes that's who knows double triple the price that uh, oh, most yeah. of the locals would be paying. I know you've gone over that in a lot of your podcasts as well, and and you know doing business in Columbia uh, in real estate since 2015, I I see it happen constantly. Uh, the 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 gringos come down and they just want it to be like the United States. They yeah, want right. it simple. They just want to go online. They want their real estate agent just to show them everything available, and they just want to pick one when the week that they're there and assume they're getting they're just paying market price because they go over the comps. They don't realize that maybe 10% of the properties for sale are actually online. And you know how Columbia works. So people just put a yeah. for sale sign in their window and you just got to literally <laughs> walk around to try to find them. But uh, and, and go over how that line. works and, and kind of maybe the opportunities that you've seen with yeah. real estate and all these uh, countries that are a lot less efficient than the United yeah. States. I, I think they're almost all less efficient and um, we can be intimidating, but you know, I think sometimes people are looking for a free lunch, right? Uh, I mean, I've gotten pretty spoiled with the relatively low cost of living. And I'm not a guy seeking a low cost of living. I just enjoy that you go to a nice restaurant and it costs a lot less than it would in the U.S. Yeah. But, you know, with this, there was a period of adjustment to, you know, realizing not everything is different. You know, there's still things I wish were a bit more like the United States. And there's still things I wish the United States were like other places. But... You know, there's a lot of money to be made. There's a lot of money to be saved. Now, you know, my clientele that I talk to, they're making you know, from half a million dollars a year up to $50 million a year. They have net worths from whatever up to billions. So, I mean, I'm not, you know, I'm speaking to someone for whom just making the move, you'll save millions of dollars in the first couple of years just from taxes, let alone right. cost of living savings. So for me, uh, you know, I have a friend who runs a business in, uh, in Cambodia buying properties. He just hires local people. It's, you know, three, 400 bucks a month is a very good salary there, I think now. And they're just calling these for sale signs. And that's how they find apartment buildings for $800 a meter in the middle of the, the city, in the middle of the capital city, Phnom Penh. Yeah. And, you know, he set up a Cambodian company. People can buy into it because it's hard to own property or pretty much impossible now to own individual properties like that as a foreigner, but he can own them in this company. And so there was some footwork setting up, but I mean, his returns now are, I think, you know, pretty good for a really core, you know, grade A property. Columbia is the same thing. Um, and, you know, this is something that we do in our business where I tell people, people bring me, you know, I'll say, hey, let's do your Colombian residence. And they'll bring me some property and I'll say, that's 40% too much because mm. they went to the, the American guy. Let me be the white guy who goes in, in fronts with the agents we found on the ground. <laughs> um, you know, because you're right. If it's online, you're probably paying too much. And if it's um, in English. Oh, if it's in English, you're dead. Um, yeah. You know, we've talked about this. We've talked about should we have a service that just helps people only, you know, you don't want the passport, you don't want the bank, you just want the real estate. I think it's worth people, you know, paying some money to get that help. But, you know, whether other people agree, I don't know. But it is a very opaque market in many cases. Yeah. What, what are your favorite real estate markets right now around the world? I think Colombia is interesting. Um, obviously, the peso is a bit of concern, uh, mm. but I, I feel relatively comfortable with Colombia. Um, I think that in Asia, Cambodia is probably the last market that I'm that I'm watching. I think it's uh, the one. I think Georgia uh, got a little uh, expensive for my taste. I think it's starting to come back. I'm also looking at some you know interesting markets that I think could be up and coming: Egypt, Uzbekistan. Um, so those are markets that, that I think are great values. Um, we could certainly talk about pro, you know markets that hold their value, uh, markets that are you know good for rental potential. Yeah, you uh, bought in Montenegro, company. didn't you? I do have a home in Montenegro. Uh, yeah, I was there in 2014, East. and I, I actually put in a couple offers there, right around uh, the other side of the bay from Old Town Kator. Yeah, and I, I didn't get anything accepted, but I was looking at Croatian Montenegro back then. I talk about them all the time. I, I really lo I loved them back then. I don't know if they've uh, gone up in value since then or if they're a little overpriced now. Everything in Europe, yeah. I mean, I remember being in Budapest, Hungary back in 13. And it was, I mean, it was just take your pick. Um, you know, Dubai, even a little bit before that, was. I mean, everyone was jumping from the windows. And uh, now all those markets have come back up. Montenegro's not cheap. I have a place there. Listen, if, you, if you're buying on the sea, there's certainly some potential, but I don't think it's as strong because anyone can manufacture a new C. If I'm looking at the best value seaside investment in the midterm, I'm going to go down to Albania. I mean, it's incredible. It's dirt cheap. It's pathetically wow. cheap. 
Now, I don't really want to go and spend my time there, so I'm choosing to make a lifestyle investment. I own a property in Malaysia. I think capital appreciation here will be very low, uh, probably for the next seven to 10 years, but I'm making a lifestyle investment. I want to own my own property and customize it to what I want uh, as a small part of my net worth. Um, but, uh, you know, those markets, I think, are, are places where you can do that. You can enjoy yourself, and I think they will hold their value and for potential they'll give you other residence or citizenship benefits. But, um, uh, you know. Yeah, so it really depends on place. what you're looking for as far as lifestyle or ROI, specifically cash flow appreciation. It's kind of like the states in that way. You got to look around for specific, uh, we call them cyclical markets or linear markets, uh, hybrid markets, something like that. But uh, the, the bottom line is there's tons of opportunity out there for uh, people who are interested in investing in real estate, especially now if, if you're worried about uh, fiat currency and devaluation of currency, getting your, your net worth into a hard asset that will most likely keep pace with inflation is always a smart decision. Uh, at the beginning of the podcast, at the beginning of the interview, we talked about Act 20 and 22. I went there in Puerto Rico in 2013, 14, something like that for Act uh, 20 and 22. And I, I know that you, you like it for some people, but it's kind of not right for others. What's your professional opinion on Puerto Rico? And I think it's called Act 60 now, if I'm not mistaken. There's a whole bunch of them, yeah. Um... They made it more difficult. There's a donation to pay. You can buy real estate now for a couple of years. Um, you know, if you are the kind of person that's in our sweet spot, if you're the seven-figure entrepreneur, I mean, it certainly makes sense because you can go there and you can uh, pay nothing in your capital gains. You can pay in the single digits on your income. Now, there are, again, whenever you're dealing with the U.S. or its territories, you've got some caveats and how you run the business and how that's set up. And I think people think that there's no rules. I had a guy recently looking to sell his business. He's owned this business for 20 years, and he was asking about moving to Puerto Rico and holding it for three more years and then selling it to take advantage of this 0% capital gains. I said, no, no, you will get 0% for three of the 23 years. So right. three 20 thirds are at zero. The rest are as they were. Yeah. And so, you know, if I'm starting a brand new business, I'm planning a quick exit, you know, that's the kind of person, maybe you're planning on expatriating from the U.S. at some point, you know, that kind of person may make uh, maybe a good person to go there uh, initially. Uh, but if you run a long-term business or if you have a business that's got tentacles all over the place, or if you just don't want all the hassle, um, you know, you've got to be there. I like what you mentioned before, an earned income exclusion. Now, I just personally don't like the U.S. To me, Puerto Rico is, I'm afraid to leave the U.S. So this is like the furthest I can get away. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I, was, again, if you're, by the way, if you're a trader and you want to do it, that's fine. Um, I do have some day traders and stuff like that. Most, because I did renounce my U.S. citizenship, I think more people who come to me come because they want help on that route, mm. getting the second passport and expatriating. Okay. But, you know, for me, why don't I have the flexibility? You take this foreign earned income exclusion. There's two different methods you can use. Either one of them is going to give you less time in the U.S. than a Puerto Rico move is, but it's going to give you fewer restrictions for the other time that you're not in the U.S. And for me, there's just so many places to see to not be stuck on one island. Yeah, I think there's something there with Puerto Rico. That if you're there for the first year after that, you're you still qualified to be a, a quote unquote bona fide resident as long mm -hmm. as you don't spend X amount of time in the United States. Uh, so you, you've got a little bit more flexibility there, but that 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 could have changed. What, There's what a number you, of tests you have to pass. I mean, and yeah. that's the thing that people don't understand. Same thing with the Australians you mentioned earlier, right? People here, and I, I hear it all the time. I don't know what to do to tell people it's not the case. If you want to become that non-tax resident of a country like Australia or Canada, or whatever, people think, oh, all I need to do is spend fewer than 183 days because that's the, the days test, they call it. Well, no, no, no. That's one of three or four or five tests in some okay. cases. So you can pass that one with flying colors, but it might be the domicile test or the permanent place of abode, or there's any number of other tests that these different countries have. You know, in Europe, a lot of countries, center of life, where's your center of life? You could spend four months there potentially. What is your profile? You could be sucked in. And so same with Puerto Rico, there's multiple tests sucked into their tax system so that, right. that, that's the key right right, right. I, I had a guy who was on a tourist visa in the united states and uh he had an actual b1 b2 sticker visa he's a british guy if i recall correctly and you can spend six months as a british guy if you get the sticker in your passport and what he didn't realize is there's a certain 
threshold when even as a tourist, you could theoretically be sucked into US taxation. So these wow. Western countries, they're not messing around. There's all kinds of ways, if you have employees, I mean, there's all kinds of ways you or your business can be sucked in. So, um, you know, I don't really speak to the corner cutting too much. Yeah, this is more of a personal question because it's something I, I've thought about, especially recently. What, what do you think about the uh, Caribbean passports, the ones that you purchase? I, I've noticed they're like half price right now because yeah. of the virus. I think they're trying to generate revenue. So like St. Kitts was like 400 grand, like now it's 200. I mean, it seems like a lot of these are on sale. What, what do you think? Well, so yeah, there's a practice called citizenship by investment, where if you don't want to wait, there's a number of ways to get a second passport. One is through your family tree, or if you're Jewish, or if you had an Irish grandparent, that kind of thing. One is if you move to a country, like you'd move to the U.S., and you see those people at the ceremony, you know, with the flag. There are other countries that don't require you to live there the way the U.S. or Germany or Australia would. You can spend one day or seven days a year there and, and then still go and wave the flag five years from now. Uh, you can also make certain kinds of investments. But probably the most straightforward way if you have the money is the citizenship by investment. There are a number of different options. Usually the best one is the donation. There's a couple countries in Europe that do it. Vanuatu does it. And then most prominently, five uh, sovereign island nations in the Caribbean. So I did the St. Lucia program. Yeah. Uh, I have other citizenships. And it was a nice compliment to those. And it was a newer program. And it had good visa-free travel and uh, just a good reputation. So. A couple of years ago, they had the hurricane come through in 2017, and they all started discounting. Okay. Now with COVID, they have not discounted a single person discount. So it's St. Lucia, Dominica, there's still 100 grand. St. Kitts, you mentioned, is 150. Uh, St. Kitts, up until a couple of years ago, was 250, or you could buy 400 in their overpriced real estate. Okay. And so they've brought it up. And so now what they're doing for for the COVID situation is what a lot of them have been doing is uh, they've discounted adding your wife, or they've you know, St. Kitts, for example, you can get four for the price of one. Now, as someone who just did a family of four uh, for one of those programs, the devil is in the details. If you want to add your parents, they often have to be dependent with you financially or even living with you, right? Um, if you want to add, you know, your children, there's certain things for them to qualify. Uh, but what they've been doing is not just counting the price for a single person. Uh, that hasn't changed. Okay. But you can add more people sometimes now, yeah. Well, go over that because one of the, the pushbacks I have from people in the United States is, is they, they see kind of me going from Columbia to St. Bart's. And the reason I'm in St. Bart's right now is because it was one of the freest places I could find that, you know, the beaches mm -hmm. are open, the restaurants are open, the gyms are open. And uh, that, that's why I'm, I'm physically here right now. It's quite a challenge to get here. But they say, well, listen, I'm going to go down with the ship because I'm never, ever, ever going to leave my family in the United States and just go sip cocktails on the beach somewhere living tax free. I would never do that to my family. They, I don't think they understand that uh, if you go through this process as, let's say, the husband or the, the, the head of the household, you can bring your family into the mix. Uh, you just talked about you know, your, your parents, your kids, your wife, your spouse. How easy or hard is that to do? Uh, with, with these Caribbean passports or any of the other passports you've been talking about? Well, I mean, as, as uh, a wise man once said, everything is easy and nothing is easy. I mean, you can procedurally, yeah, you can add your parents to, generally these investment programs, it's easier. Okay. Um, if you look at some of the golden visas in Europe that will eventually lead to citizenship, but not right away, sometimes that's harder. If you want to look at a residence program, like you can become a resident of Mexico. Now, it's not really that difficult. Um, so every person could just qualify on their own. So it really depends on the programs. Um, again, an example that I just mentioned, I had a, a guy where everyone was wealthy. He wanted to do him and his siblings and the parents, and they all had their own money. Okay. And so it made it a bit more difficult to find a program for him. There was one. Uh, and even then, it cost more than the family of four price because the fourth person was was like, a you know, not the kind of family member that they ideally or they generally included. So it can be done, or in some of these programs, I mean, depending on how you do it, it could be just a matter of, um, you know, giving them their own residence permit. What I might say is, listen, let's imagine you're St. Lucian. I don't live in St. Lucia, but I can go as a St. Lucian and I can go and get a residence permit in pretty much every any country I want, right? Mm -hmm. Most countries, maybe the US and Australia, and maybe Canada, those three might judge you. 
Everybody else doesn't particularly care. Right. You come to Malaysia, you go to Costa Rica, what's your nationality? All right, great, Just, you know, put the application in the pile. They don't care. So I don't think you should necessarily look at it as living in St. Lucia. St. Lucia is like the cruise ship flag of convenience. If we're going that cruise ship, you look down, he's like, you know, flagged in Liberia. That cruise ship ain't going to Liberia. No one wants to go to Liberia. But <laughs> they can fly the flag of Liberia as they travel the world. They can take advantage of the very generous laws in Liberia. They can pay people whatever they pay in Liberia. You know, that's the law they work under. And so if you're a St. Lucian, for example, their laws, no wealth tax, no gift tax, no estate tax. You know, they're not heckling you. If you want to live in, you know, you know Myanmar and do business as the, as the Burmese do, go right ahead. It's not our problem. And I'm not saying it's a lawlessness, but they're just saying, listen, you want to live here, you follow our rules. If you live somewhere else, you follow their rules. And yeah. so go and be a St. Lucian living in Colombia, for example. And then you can bring your parents down, for example, on a much more easy residence permit. Maybe they can work their way towards citizenship in that residence country. But I think really you want to, uh, again, slice and dice these things into what's the best way to handle each thing. Where you live and where you're a citizen aren't necessarily the same issue and they don't necessarily have the same pros or cons. Yeah, but I, I think the main takeaway here is that where there's a will, there's a way. And, and if you want to, um, let's say, diversify your political risk, that's how I would say it, or diversify yeah. your country risk, uh, have a plan B. There's a way to do it that's right for you and right for your, for your entire family. Now, it might be different than your neighbor or it might be different than another person. But, but there, and it's logistically, it might be difficult, but there is a way to do it if you're working with a pro, uh, such as this guy named Andrew Henderson, <laughs> the nomad capitalist. He can make it happen for you for sure. I, I know we're, uh, we're limited on time, Andrew. Last question here. I want to get your take on what's happening right now with COVID, with the virus, and mm -hmm. how this is kind of bringing into the forefront the, the need to have a secondary passport uh, moving forward. I, I was just at a cocktail party on Saturday night with uh, a couple of, uh, you know, a young couple, they're, they're just uh, in the process of getting married. And it's the, the gal is American, the guy is European, and they're, they're pretty much stuck here in St. Bart's because no other country will let her in right now because she only has an American passport. And it's this logistical nightmare where if she just had a second passport like St. Uh, Lucia or something like that, that it, it would be just, it would be much, much easier to get around and to, for them to actually get married. So how has COVID brought this into the, the forefront? Well, you know, it, being an American these days, it's like uh, Casablanca. I mean, you're yeah. just stuck. And yeah. um, what's interesting is how many countries, uh, you know, my theory and everything is just, people are just trying to check boxes in their life. You know, the guy at the, the security guard at the mall, the bureaucrat, you know, whatever. They're just trying to check boxes. They're just trying to do things that sound good, feel good. And so when I had a friend who had been out of the United States, he hasn't been back for multiple years, but he left the country he lives in and he couldn't come back because he only had the American passport. They thought, oh, well, you've been living in the U.S. No, I've been living in another country. I just visited for like a month, you know, a place that was perfectly safe. And now I want to come back. Uh -uh. Yeah. And, and so he's not a threat, but it's a matter of box checking. The Americans can't come in. The American passport's one of the worst as we speak. Uh, I mean, did you ever think the day that a, uh, you'd ever see the day where a Georgian passport in the former Soviet Union or a Serbian, Serbian passport in the former Yugoslavia is better than a U.S. passport for travel. Yeah. And when you and say better, great. Andrew, meaning you can get into more countries right more now countries. with a Serbian passport than you have a U.S. passport. Uh, yeah, Georgia and Serbia are both better than the U.S. because the U.S. is banned from Europe and those countries are not. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, not only is it the travel issue, but it's also the restrictions. And what kind of new restrictions are they going to impose, i.e., oh, we're closed for an emergency, uh, you, we're not issuing passports or, or this or that. Uh, so there's all kinds of things where I think what we're seeing is you don't want one set of bureaucrats dictating what happens to you in your life. Exactly. I've known that for a long time when I work with crypto investors and the U.S. makes it harder and harder and harder to be a crypto investor, a crypto trader. You, you might as well just forget it. You're a criminal to them. Uh, and other industries as well. But now just add this to the pile in a way that people can easily understand 
yeah, I mean, more passports means more options. It means more advantages. It means you can, you know, kind of shift the profile a little bit. I call it, if mommy won't let you, what do you do as a kid? You go and talk to daddy. And daddy, <laughs> maybe he want, maybe he says, go ahead and have the cookie. And I think it's a good option that people uh, should not be uh, forced to listen to Trump or to Biden or to Macron or to, you know, Yacinda, Theo Smith. You know, people should have options. That's right. That's right. All right, buddy. Well, for any of my viewers or listeners who want to find out more about you or what you do, where can they go? Well, so I wrote the book, uh, Nomad Capitalist, which is a good place to start. You know, yeah. We have 900 videos plus on YouTube for free. And we have on Amazon, two. right? You always said it. it's on Amazon. Yeah. It's, you know, you can go and read 2000 blog posts. You can go and read and watch 900 videos and, and people do. That's a good place to go once you want to dial in. But this is kind of a good introduction. It's not an exact plan. It's not going to tell you the best country for your specific situation as an IT coder living in Montreal. But it's a good you know, introduction to what's possible, what's not possible. People, people often confuse what's possible and not. Uh, if you read that, if you watch the videos, if you read the blog post, you can go to nomadcapitalist.com. And uh, generally what we're working with is high six, seven, and eight figure entrepreneurs and investors uh, on a very limited boutique basis who want kind of a holistic uh, bird's eye plan of, of making sure that the U.S. matches up with all the other places, making sure that what you do in Australia or Hong Kong or whatever is not contradicting something somewhere else. So uh, it's a bit of an art, um, but you know, that's what you can do. Yeah. All right. Well, I can't suggest it enough. Andrew, thank you for your time. And I can't wait to do it again. All right, let's, let's do it. Thanks, man.